Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode 105 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today I have back with me Barry Vitale, one half of the BriberyAct.com guys. Barry's going to visit with us about what's going on in the Bribery Act, some enforcement actions, investigations, comments by Director David Green, and status of the Serious Fraud Office. The episode is about 25 minutes, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, it is my distinct privilege and pleasure to have back with me Barry Vitale, one half of the BriberyAct.com guys, uh, a fabulous resource to the compliance practitioner in the United States, the United Kingdom, and indeed across the world. There is a partner at Pinson Masons in the city of London, and he's taken time from his Friday afternoon to uh, visit with us today. So, Barry, thanks a lot for coming back on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Good afternoon. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a uh, chance to catch up, and a fair amount, I think, has gone on both formally um, in UK courts and informally in the form of commentary by yourself and Richard and indeed a conference held at Pinsent Masons where mm -hmm. Serious Fraud Office Director uh, David Green uh, visited with uh, compliance practitioners and in-house types. Uh, so I just wanted to see if I could catch up with you, see what might be happening in your part of the world and specifically start with uh, the conference held at Pinson Masons in October. Yes, um, we at Pinson Masons run an annual uh, compliance conference. This year, um, the theme was international. David Green came, kindly came along was our keynote speaker. We had a panel of uh, prosecutors as well. So we had the uh, US DOJ representative from the US Embassy in London. Uh, we had some people in from OCO Crim, which is the Norwegian Serious Fraud Office equivalent. Um, so, uh, and some others. Uh, and then we also had some in-house counsel from various large corporates that you will have heard of. So for example, we had uh, uh, in-house counsel from uh, Rolls-Royce, for example, uh, sorry, uh, Chief Compliance Officer of Rolls-Royce and others among uh, the that community. Um, we run a couple of breakout sessions in the afternoon, uh, which included how to run investigations, best practice compliance, operating in Southeast Asia, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, my partner, Neil McInnes, has just moved out to Southeast Asia to launch our practice out there because um, uh, lots of companies find that a challenging jurisdiction in which to do business. And then uh, at the end of the day, uh, we were joined from Connecticut by a gentleman called Richard Bistron. Uh, who um, has had the misfortune to be on the wrong end of uh, a DOJ, I guess, prosecution and um, went to prison for his sins, uh, but is now out and has his own blog where he speaks about compliance. So um, it, was a, it was actually a really good day uh, and something I thought for everyone, and I particularly like the, the, the colour both from David Green and from Richard Bistrong, uh, because um, particularly with in relation to Richard Bistrong, um, I think there's a danger that we all sit um, uh, and are perhaps perceived by people out in the field, the exec VPs of sales, etc., as people in sort of an ivory tower. Um, and uh, he was able to give a perspective of um, what perhaps his perspective was or perception was uh, in the field. And that was a person that unfortunately a compliance program didn't really work on. So that was interesting. So uh, let me turn to uh, Director Green and some of his remarks. And I should preface it by saying there's been commentary in the United States press that uh, perhaps in, in, um, in my enlightened state, I read the FT, so in the English press as well, uh, about uh, the Serious Fraud Office, perhaps rolling the Serious Fraud Office into another department of uh, the UK government. And so uh, it's... Uh, I guess Director Green is still fighting battles uh, along those lines. So could you just kind of bring us up to date on where those might be? Yeah, I mean, I think it seems, I think it's unfortunate that they have this um, level of uncertainty um, around them of what, of what seems to be a sort of a two yearly cycle. Um, I, there were reports, which I think the FT ran after the Tory party conference in the UK, uh, that um, there were, uh, the Home Secretary here, Theresa May, was looking to, or at least was canvassing opinion on uh, rolling the SFO. Or
the NCA, which left a big question mark over, once again, the future of the SFO. Um, I think it's fair to say, I don't think I, beyond, I didn't think I actually read any commentary anywhere which was supportive of that proposal. And um, certainly I'm not supportive of it, uh, and various others came out and said that they weren't supportive of it. And uh, I haven't really heard that much more about it. My sort of, my, I guess my perception might be, um, or is, that uh, there are other fish to fry at the moment, and we would do well to focus on those other fish to fry. I think the SFO is, is doing a, a, a not a bad job at the moment, frankly. Uh, I think that, um, as David Green has said I, said, I said it when I met, ran into him in the street, um, some months ago, but he said it a couple of times himself. I, I put it that he had a spring in his step. He says the SFO has its mojo back. Uh, the funding issue, I think, is still there, but they've been getting this blo blockbuster funding in, so actually there's more money uh, available than, 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 than just the annual budget, and they have been getting it. Um, and I, you know, I mean, he said that, he, to be fair to him, he signed up for a four-year deal. Uh, he is two and a half years through that deal. I think it was widely acknowledged at the time that he signed up to that, that there would be um, some sort of uh, stock take at the end of his tenure, that contract. Um, and I think it would be premature, is my personal view at the moment, to really be thinking about doing anything with it since it has not yet had the opportunity to run its full course. Although, as David Green says, and I have no reason to disagree particularly, they appear to have... Um, sort of the, 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 the clean-up operation that, that needed to be done or whatever uh, post the former director has now been done and I think he's looking to see some results. So I, I, my view is it would be a, for all sorts of reasons which I won't go into now because it's a bit technical but basically um, it sort of isn't broken so why fix it? It's where I come from. I mean I think there are questions, there are certainly things that UK law enforcement could do better when it comes to economic crime. There are certainly things off um, but I think that of all of the agencies that you look at at the moment in the context of, of, of fraud probably the serious fraud office um, is probably the most sorted out of them all um, and you might focus on perhaps the banner the, the, the cases that the SFO might not take on for whatever reason and who's doing those and I know um, that you know my understanding is that there isn't anybody at the NCA for example charged with the task of fighting economic crime I, I look forward to being bombarded uh, with various people saying that I'm 110% uh, wrong uh, but I don't think they've got the capability at the moment for example I, you know there's the question mark that I posited some months ago as to why uh, on a historical annual basis of 10,000 um, uh, suspicious activity reports per annum uh, is the uh, NCA only sending out less than 70 uh, intelligence packs to various authority agencies to investigate? It seems to me that on any view that, uh, that ratio looks light. Which, which could be done. I'm not, I don't mean to criticise any particular agency or any... Or, 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 uh, but it seems to me that um, there are other areas of focus. Um, Barry, let me uh, turn down, uh, now turn rather to some remarks that uh, Director Green made, which you reported in the briberyact.com regarding self disclosure. And I want to start off by prefacing uh, my question with he emphasized that the guidance that was released uh, around the Bribery Act, uh, in large part, is still valid with the noted exception of uh, self disclosure. So could you talk about that, the change in self-disclosure and Director Green's remarks at your conference? Well, I think if we were to boil it, I mean, there's, there were a lot, of, a lot of changes, and I'm not going to bore all of the viewers by taking them through what the details are. They are available on the SFA website, and if you really want to look up and find them, they're also available on the bribeapp.com because I did a sort of composite rolled-up version of them. But um, what, so it seems to me that there was one uh, significant material change to the position uh, pre and post uh, uh, the new, the, the latest director, D David Green, uh, and that is that uh, under the old regime, uh, there was a there was a hint, a strong hint, actually, that um, if you self disclosed, you, you as a corporate, you would get a civil resolution. That that is to say, 
that there would no, there would that, that that you would not be prosecuted. And at that time, there was no deferred prosecution agreement regime, and various people had problems with that. Um, uh, not least the NGO community, who said it was just you know wrong uh, that um, there was one law for say corporate white collar and another law for somebody that stole a tin of baked beans from the uh, supermarket. So, um, so that's, that, that position has now changed. Um, and I think that, you know, y y that, uh, that, 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 that's definitely gone away. I, I don't think that that is a controversial change, particularly in the sense that um, in the US, and I know people make a great play of the certainty that you get in the US, but I, I was sat on a panel yesterday with a, a colleague, a US colleague, and I had a bit of fun with him because um, he made this observation that actually in the context of UK deferred prosecution agreements about how the UK system was really, really uncertain and, and, and they had this judge, this terrible thing called a judge involved in the process. And, and, and that judge was, would gain, uh, was a significant variable and really uh, companies in the UK would be um, very, very uh, nervous about going in if a judge was involved. And I said, you know... Um, uh, I'm looking forward to working with you on a matter where we walk into the DOJ on day one of a disclosure and before I tell them anything about anything about my client, I'm going to say so anyway. Uh, we all know this is going to end in a DPA, don't we? Uh, so, um, or, 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 or a declination. So um, let's get that inked right now and then we'll start talking. And of course, the answer is they're never, ever going to say that. So, um, and I then advocated that actually I thought the, invol the involvement of a judge in the process um, was something that I welcomed in the UK because it's some sort of objectivity and I'm, I, uh, although I might um, disagree with some of the things that Mike Kaler talks about uh, on his blog from time to time, I know that he has strong views about these things, I think it is fair to say that there, are, that there is this question mark about whether, um, uh, you know, the, the, the DOJ record was it. I don't think they've successfully prosecuted a corporate uh, ever it, when it comes to FCPA. Uh, they tried. They, I think they won one, lost one, and lost that one on appeal. So, so it's sort of um, uh, two, ni two nil. Uh, but you can correct me on the stats. I'm sure you know better than I. Uh, there um, a few successful prosecutions. But, well, I'm talking about corporates, not individuals. Okay. Okay, no, individuals are different. Uh, but even then, we get to a spotty track record with a 40, uh, whatever it is, quite a lengthy enforcement record. And actually, if you boil down the cases, uh, and I'm talking about the corporate bribery scam schemes as opposed to the number of enforcement actions and that's a different thing you don't get to huge quantities of prosecutions you do get i think uh, anyway but but mike Kayla's book which i happen to uh, i've reviewed in the summer and i thought was excellent um on this soft topic at least sets it out and i'm not gonna i haven't got the stats on me but in any event it seems to me that um uh, I was really advocating that the, 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 input in, the, the injection of a judge into the process, which is something that um, I think Jed Rakoff has been trying to do in the US in, in various different guises, is not a bad thing, and uh, as opposed to being this, um, this huge variable that could upset the apple cart, or when actually the day that you walk into the DOJ, I think, or the SFA, is a big decision, because you cannot predict on that day what the outcome is necessarily uh, going to be so but I think that that's the big UK difference um, when you in terms of what I guess people that go in to do a self-report hope they get out and come out with which is a DPA there's a lot of uh, um, other sort of detailed stuff there is a debate on privilege in the UK uh, at the moment in the context of um, interview notes uh, first account notes with witnesses and things like that again um, people get very excited about that here, uh, and perhaps right, and, and rightly so, up to a point. But it gets into the weeds pretty quickly, so I don't want to lose the viewers. Um, and then some of the other, you know, I, the the truth is, and I keep saying it, you know, the proof of the pudding on all of this stuff is going to be in the eating. So they need to do one, basically, is what they need to do now. Gary, it seems that the uh, SFO has been in the news a little bit more for uh, prosecutions investigations, you talked about the blockbuster funding, some of the names we've heard here in the states are of course GSK, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Rolls-Royce, Alstom. Uh, can you kind of tell us what's going on in the public arena in, in those spheres? 
Well, I think that um, I, <clears throat> I think that what you can say about the, and I have been saying this consistently, um, largely to an audience of zero, uh, <laughs> that, um, that that people are completely fixated and have a fetish about the first bribery act conviction, and uh, until they see one, there is this sort of. Um, uh, head in the sand type, you know, whatever denial approach to, you know, the SFO is a joke, which should be closed down, etc., 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 which I don't think really uh, comports with reality. And what you've now read in the newspapers, and you just mentioned some of the cases, and by the way, they're not all bribery cases. We have seen, um, you know, recent news stories in the press you may have come across in relation to Tesco's, which is all about um, misstatement of accounts, for example. Sure. Um, but I mean, I think, so what I take from all of that, uh, which really links back to where we started, your first question, or the question about um, the, S of the future of the SFO, is they have started to do some pretty chunky investigations. So they are sort of, and you've really got to see um, where they come out on all of that stuff. Um, and just like the DOJ, some of it, no doubt, will be successful, and some, some of it, no doubt, won't be, or will, doesn't necessarily mean... I hope that we never, that I never live in a country where every investigation and prosecution uh, results in a conviction. Um, Russia's a bit like that, by the way. They're very proud of the record that 99.999% of the cases that they prosecute result in a conviction. I'm not so sure that I'm comfortable in that sort of society. But they, the point is that they, the SFO has, uh, is engaged in, a, a, what I think is quite a large number now, quite serious big-time investigations into some um, very large companies. I think the, for me, if I was doing the compare and contrast between the UK and the US at the moment, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and that would be, uh, when I look at the roster, and I'm not saying I'm happy about this, by the way, when I look at the roster of companies that the SFO is investigating, and then perhaps when I look at the roster of companies the US is investigating, I, si I, I simply observe but the, US, the UK, for reasons which I suspect are extremely British and relate to cricket, uh, involve mostly UK companies, whereas the US, uh, I don't know about the rules of baseball, but they seem to relate the preponderance of companies the US investigates do appear to be non-US companies, which I find interesting. Uh, no doubt a uh, relation between the scoring in baseball and the scoring in cricket. Uh, but uh, perhaps the SFO is investigating some U.S. companies as well, and we may hear about that later. Maybe. Uh, Barry, I wanted to ask you now about uh, what I thought was clearly a Barry Vital post on the briberyact.com, where you opine that if your code of conduct is more than three pages, you've lost everyone. And I raise that in, with some humor and, and with some lightness. Nevertheless, it, uh, for me, cont uh, continues a theme that you you talk about, which is try to get people practical information that they can use. Long written policies and procedures are not something that can be of a lot of use when you're out in doing business in an emerging market in a company. So could, tell us about the blog post and what your thoughts might be. Right. Well, I think, I mean, I, look, I'm probably as guilty as anybody. I, I'm sure I'm going to mea culpa now, but I've probably sold somebody a policy that's four pages long all <laughs> in my time. Um, but I think, you know, these things are an evolution. And I was into I, the reason that the catalyst for that post actually was really um, a comment, a throwaway comment that David Green made, which is referenced in the post with which I uh, wholly endorse. And that is that I think that and you picked up on it, it's, it's a question of practicality, really. Um, there is a tendency, I think, among lawyers, and sometimes among clients, that they want a policy, and they want that policy to capture absolutely everything. And they wrap it all up into one neat package. And so you can end up with policies, as I've seen, that uh, include within them, although they're called an anti-bribery, I mean, an anti-bribery policy could be a sentence, really, couldn't it? It could be two words, don't bribe, right? Uh, and... Um, uh, uh, but it isn't real. But that, we all know that that's not enough, right? We all know that there's all sorts of things that you need to do. The problem is that lawyers, I think, um, and I am one, but uh, but but look, there is a tendency to sort of focus on the document, make sure that everything's covered off, and you could, you always worry. I mean, it's a bit like watching somebody's presentation sometimes, where they stand up and do a 20 minute presentation. They know they can't cover their topic in 20 minutes, and they decide to reduce the font size on the slide deck. 
and you end up with a 20 minute presentation with 50 slides with a, with a font size of four, just in case they missed anything off. Uh, the upshot, of course, of that is that nobody can actually read what's on the deck. And if you can't read it, you don't do it. And I think um, there's certainly been, I can, I can think of policies that I've seen, uh, sometimes that clients have asked for, which you know, an anti-bribery policy, which incorporates corporate hospitality policy, which incorporates an onboarding policy, which talks about all sorts of different stuff. And it's great. You can't argue with a single line in these policies. The problem with it is it isn't properly uh, embedded, uh, implemented and integrated into their existing systems. So if uh, these policies were followed to the letter, uh, however long they were, it would be great. But the problem is that they're not. Uh, it raises a big integration problem in my mind. In practical terms, that's what I have seen. Um, and I think, you know, and I, I, I get this, um, you know, frequently if I'm asked to look at a policy, let's say of a target on an M&A deal, um, uh, and, you know, you could ask what time of day it is, what month it is, is it Christmas, uh, have you ever had an investigation, whatever it might be, what's your name, uh, and the answer uh, from the corporate lawyers acting for the vendor will typically be see the policy, because that obviously is the font of all answers. You know this as well. Um, and, um, and, and, and attempts to um, try and convince my corporate colleagues uh, that perhaps we should ask a different question are rebuffed because they've only got three questions that they're allowed to go back and ask on the second round of questions. Uh, so, uh, and, and, um, and, they not, and they like to sort of green out lots of their sort of Excel spreadsheet of their due diligence, whatever. So um, I have, um, I adopted the policy, uh, I adopted the strategy of um, basically uh, reading the policy, which is a shocker, I know. Yeah. Uh, you read the policy, um, what you typically find is it, re it references, uh, particularly the, long the longer the better if you're looking to unpick stuff, it, it references sometimes dozens of things which the companies say that they do. Uh, and because um, you're simply doing what they told you to do and asking questions about that fact, funnily enough you get to ask a load more questions than you might otherwise. And the answer to those questions is often, well we didn't do any of that stuff. And that is um, really the acid test of the policy. Now, I thought that uh, I asked David Green, uh, um, can you, you know, uh, if you're coming after a corporate and um, you're, you're looking at adequate procedures, what is it that you're going to be looking for? And um, he, uh, his instant response, of course, is I don't give advice. Barry, you know that. Stop asking me questions. Um, but I pressed him, um, and he said, well, you know, he threw, this was a throwaway, you know, he said, I don't like long policies. And I thought that was quite an insightful remark, really, because he and I both know, and you know, that a 20-page policy that sits in the bottom drawer that doesn't get properly implemented, a sales guy, you know, how many times have you written an advice note for a client that goes over two pages, and, they, and you know they don't get to the end of the second, first page. It all has to be an executive summary in one paragraph at the front, otherwise they don't read it. I'm as guilty as that as anybody when I get the 200 emails a day, most of which don't contain anything of value sent to me. And you just skim them and say, okay, is that something I need to worry about or not? And um, I think that's what we've got. It's all about practical implementation. And on a more serious note, I think in the same thing uh, in my defense, I said to these things, the, all the, there have to be a whole bunch of controls. I'm not saying there aren't controls, but they have to be baked into other stuff. And you have to sort of, um, hide them in, or embed them or whatever into existing process because if you do not do that, you know, what are the chances that your onboard, your procurement team who have presumably at least two or three forms before they onboard a supplier into the business, credit checks, all that sort of stuff that they will do, uh, if you don't bake in your anti-bribery into that form that they've got to fill in with the credit control for Standard & Poor's or whatever it is, uh, uh, Dun & Bradstreet checks, all the, those boxes, um, they are just simply not going to turn to the 25-page ABC policy sat in your drawer. It just won't happen. And that means that your ABC policy, it doesn't matter whether it's fantastic legal prose uh, and is all 110% correct. If it ain't being followed, it's a whole lot worse than a three-page that everybody knows. So uh, that was all I'm, that's what I'm saying. And I do think um, I, I think uh, it's. I think I'm sure you would agree, but I'm interested interested to hear what you think about it. No, the uh, the part about it's actually the baking in controls to your routine business processes that uh, most lawyers don't understand. 
because we we view it as okay I'm gonna write a 20 page policy it's gonna be perfect everyone's gonna read it everyone's gonna understand it everyone's gonna follow it it's not gonna happen and if you don't take those controls to implement whatever the length of your policy is put those into your business processes you're gonna have a systemic failure at some point yeah and so I think you know happily we're all on, we're all on the same page what I thought was interesting and I did write the headline you know, if you've got a three and a half page policy, it probably will work. But I wrote the headline to grab attention. And the interesting thing about that was uh, that um, it, got, it got quite a lot of traction. And a lot of people saying, oh, you know, this is interesting, which I sort of think is, I'm not surprised it got a lot of people saying that's, in, that's an interesting opinion um, by which, and I, it's a bit like in an English court when someone says, with all due respect, uh, an interesting opinion means this guy is completely crazy, uh, uh, but I, you know, but I'm, but I may be completely crazy, uh, but I am also right. Uh, I would say, uh, well, I'm going to leave aside the issue of whether you're completely. <laughs> right, that's the subject of a completely different discussion. <laughs> Nevertheless, the the important point you re-emphasize to me is that it's it's the day-to-day -day controls baked into your regular business processes. And until lawyers understand that, I don't think we can adequately advise our clients. And I have to say that it wasn't until probably this summer that that light bulb went off in my head. And um, we have something here in the United States called the COSO framework that is uh, go going into uh, effect uh, change in December. And it's gonna affect internal controls. And uh, for a lawyer to as um, as an internal auditor told me, he said, if you can spell COSO, you're go to the head of the class for a lawyer. So uh, I'm finally, that light bulb went off the side of my head, and I'm trying to re-educate myself and trying to spread that gospel that, that you are as well. So um, thanks for that very good insight. That's a, a very good way to put it. Uh, Barry, we're at the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank you again, and I was wondering if uh, anyone wanted to follow up on any of your comments or remarks. Could they email you? Yeah, they're by all means. Email me, tweet me at the Bribery Act. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty easy to find, I think. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, and I look forward to our next visit. Thank you.